All right, so um, I am uh, pretty excited to be here with Janelle and Samir, um, two of uh, a hardcore team of folks looking at the model layer. Um, I, I sort of sit at the application layer and pretend to be a complete idiot when I'm interacting with the, the two of you when it comes to all things model. Um, but uh, I know this is where you're spending a, a ton of your time and um, I am super interested in it. And in particular, I know we've been debating a lot internally like this question around closed source versus open source. And you've been trying to educate me on maybe that's an over, oversimplification, but give me the state of the model portion of the cloud, um, especially with respect to this debate of closed source versus open source. Like, where do we stand? Sure. So just kind of take a step back, back when I think about, you know, browser wars, search wars, mobile wars, cloud wars, there always seems to be an aggressive turf war at the foundational layer during the early days of every major tech platform shift. Um, and again, the age of AI is no different where the model layer is now shaping up to be one of the most dynamic and hotly contested layers within the AI ecosystem. And, and why is that the case compared to, you know, maybe on the app side? Foundation models are certainly kind of like the new oil, if you will, that will fuel a lot of downstream AI applications and tooling. And the winners here really will define the future of AI infrastructure and AI applications for many I mean, years now, to come. At, at some level, is it just, it's the most obvious battleground and there are a ton of big companies who to just want to do something and want to be involved and they can move huge dollars into this space well, or is that and that's, I think that's the key Kent, which is that to do uh, one of these large language models at the scale that is required uh, to be truly horizontal. Yeah. Uh, there are only a handful of companies on the planet that have both the capital and, and in importantly, the compute to be able to build one of these things. And so I'll tell you, personally, I, I didn't believe that this was a venture investable category uh, for a long time because I just thought this is going to be a cloud wars redux. This is like, you know, it's going to be Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google all over again. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and I think my perspective has evolved a little bit since then. But, but I do think that by and large, the, the advantages that the big tech folks have with cloud and capital um, uh, is is not to be trifled with. I mean, just to pick at it, like, what is the advantage of being a startup in model land when you're sort of battling yeah. against these Godzillas all around you? Like, is that yeah. vanity or is there something that the startup's going to bring that's going to actually be differentiated? Yeah, I actually think that, uh, and, you know, we have so much debate around this, it's not the most highly funded companies or the biggest companies or the companies backed by, you know, big tech strategics that is going to win. And we've, this is why I think the open source versus closed source debate is such a hot button debate, because a lot of big tech companies have backed closed source players, if you will. Um, in fact, I think 90% of funding in AI for model layer companies last year was driven by corporate VCs. And of course, most of those companies were closed source. You've seen this whole flourishing of um, open source models that actually come pretty close or have closed that performance gap, really showing that you don't necessarily need the support of um, big tech companies to or huge amounts of compute spend to get ahead. But innovation from a community can lead to better outcomes. Um, and with Llama 3, again, that is that is from a big tech um, kind of initiative. But we see models from Mistral really driving innovation here and closing the gap on their closed source players, kind of presenting a, a counter example, if you will, that um, you don't need to be a closed source or, or walled garden to do well in this space. Yeah. So and I'm totally going to disagree with that. Can, can I, can I disagree ahead. with Janelle's okay. last comment, <laughs> which, is, which is, I totally agree that from a, from a pure technology perspective, that may be true. And maybe the open source folks can stay in the game. They can be close enough over time. But as we know, Winners and losers in software and technology are rarely about just the technology. It's also about the distribution. And this is where I where I flip the bid on whether this is VC investable or not, which is uh, you have to have the customers and the distribution as well. And so now all of a sudden, the alignment with the big tech, the major cloud providers, the hyperscalers, if you can have if you're one of those startups that has alignment and has their capital, now there's an incentive for the thousands of sales reps at the hyperscalers to go out and 
advocate for your per, for your LLM to be sold because they want your compute dollars funneled back to them, <laughs> right? They've given, like in the case of take uh, uh, Anthropic, Anthropic got you know billion four billion dollars from AWS. They got two billion dollars from Google. Now a lot of that is going to get earmarked for for compute spend to go back to those hyperscalers, right? Well, the only way that happens though is if customers are actually buying enough Anthropic for Anthropic to need that much compute. <laughs> and so you have this wonderful alignment if you're Anthropic where thousands of reps out in the field at both of those hyperscalers want to push Anthropic. And so I don't see the same happening for a Mistral or a Llama or a fill in the blank um, yeah. where, where you've got an like enterprise sales force out there pushing those models. Well, the question that, that like, be if you're if you're one of those large you know, public cloud providers, and you're trying to drive, you know, more volume to your, to your cloud, um, why align with just one closed source player? Like, shouldn't they be playing the field more aggressively? Or is that just not practical? Well, I think they will. Um, in the case of Google, I think they will largely, you know, bias towards Gemini. Um, but I think that um, if you take somebody like an Amazon, they have long standing tradition of we are customer first, best, may the best product win. Um, I think Microsoft obviously has a huge bias towards the, the open AI relationship that they have established. Um, but, I, but I do believe that, and, and I guess that's because I just said that those, those alignments, I think, are what the rest of the AI world will pivot around. I think no. it will be a handful of those LLM models at scale being pushed into the enterprise by those players and it will be those models. Yeah, Samir, I guess my counter to that would be, you know, open source revolution is striking back. Like they are seeing this happening closed source and their way of getting into the game is through bottoms up community action. And if you look on Hugging Face, I haven't run the latest numbers, but early in the year, there were, uh, you know, four times the number of open source models and engagement than they were at the start of 2023. And that's growing yeah. kind of exponentially. So again, you know, maybe it speaks to how fast the space is moving and how there's so many new participants, but I don't think open source kind of sees what's going on with the distribution point. Certainly, I think closed source will have an advantage by aligning with um, certain, you know, large cloud providers or compute providers or storage providers, but open source is finding, you know, their own wedge, um, which certainly relies on yeah. the community the dev first motion, the AI engineer first motion to kind of um, find competitive advantage here. So Janelle, I'm going to put you on the spot um, and caveat, like who the hell knows the answer to the question I'll ask, but um, five years from now, do you think they're the, the different models, the, the dominant open source model, the dominant closed source models have like differentiated ability to deliver on the core action of transformer model, you know, input and response, or do you think that goes to total commodity? And then we've got a separate question of who gets to cap or capture the value, but just at the pure model technical level, do you think we're headed to total commoditization? I think I'm in the middle. Of course, you have one extreme where it's, you know, totally commoditized. There's another extreme where it's kind of like potato chip market is the analogy we're using where there are just diversity of flavors of models. I certainly am somewhere in between. I do think there will be a handful of companies that will split the pie and each of these winners will find their own wedge. So there will probably be a closed source winner that has a distribution edge. There might be an open source winner that just has a community edge. There will be a technological winner that could be closed or open source that just has the best model for maybe a particular use case or industry. I think there'll be a handful. I don't think it'll be, um, you know, a very, very long tail, if you will, but, um, and but I don't think value also only accrues to one or two players. All right, Samir, how about you? Do you think we're headed for potato chips? Potato chip land with a thousand <laughs> rings, or are we kind of like Coke, Pepsi, Sam's Club situation yeah. where there's like, yeah, that stuff's not quite as good, but it's a lot cheaper, and and there's still a market for Coke uh, and Pepsi. Man, I, I I feel I buy as strongly to the latter camp. I think it's a handful of player. I think it's just like what we saw in the cloud. I think you'll have three, maybe there's four on the outside. Um, there are big enough players, and it's a big enough tam. Like we can't understate this. Like uh, this. It's a trillion dollar TAM uh, in cloud and everybody I talk to, uh, I think tends to agree that intelligence AI is going to be a trillion dollar plus market um, TAM uh, and I'm talking revenue, not market cap. I mean, like, I just think there's so much spend to be had here. There'll be multiple players, but I don't think it's more than three or four. 
just because of the nature of the dynamic of, you know, to build one of these large language models that is multimodal and can do everything and all of humanity's reasoning. I think that's just, the, that's a hard, hard yeah, problem that requires multi-multing markets where an economist might tell us that in theory, you know, there's not going to be yeah. much risk to be had, but when the market is growing a thousand percent a year for 10 years, like there's, there's yeah. ways for people to make some profit. Um, so that, that just the, the gravity of that may, may come down inside of it. Um, totally. And I think that, you know, to your question on the commodity part, I do think five years from now, just like with cloud computing, you know, do you think is, is spinning up a virtual machine on EC2 or uh, GCP or Azure wildly different? I don't think it is. It's largely, I think it'll, I think those differences will be, will be right. modest. I think it'll be more about plugging into an ecosystem of other tooling that some of those, those large players um, may, may make easier, that kind of stuff. But man, I, I think um, uh, just as we saw with cloud, it can get quote unquote commoditized but yeah, most, uh, most of the technology underlying that core action is open source is commoditized effectively, but there's still margins to be had in the, in the cloud providers, right? Hey, look, AWS is running a 20% margin. I, I take a 20% margin on a hundred billion dollar a year business. I, you can call that a commodity all, all we want. <laughs> that's a pretty, that's a hell of a business. And yeah, like uh, these, oil, you know, these foundation models can do it. Right. That's oil right. In, you know, I, pretty big businesses people are making money selling oil um, <laughs> that may be the case totally. um, yeah okay great so let me um let me shift to a slightly different topic which is did you think globally you know are you one of these nine-dimensional chess players who thinks about the geopolitics of different models globally and how that's going to sort out and is that even knowable like what, what are the early things that we're seeing there i don't know janelle if you've paid any attention to that Yes, certainly so. And, you know, regulation, and we just talked about open source regulation, such a big part of the discussion there. Um, and so it definitely bleeds into kind of taking a broader view of, um, will the geopolitics or regulation bleed into the AI wars? Or said another way, could AI be the next frontier for a lot of global competitive advantage? Um, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I certainly think that's the case just because um, it makes sense for each sovereign nation to try and build up their own AI capabilities. Again, you have concerns around privacy, data storage, um, potential breaches, and you do want to be able to control um, the the kind of AI environment that you're in. So I think it's really hard to separate um, kind of AI model layer, again, where you the models do have unfair access to a lot of private data, expansive um, data storage. Uh, to kind of not have that be part of the conversation. I, I totally agree. I think this is actually the one dimension on which um, the best LLMs in the world, I mentioned there will only be three or four. Um, I think that is true of the best in the world. I think we will see uh, half a dozen that are sovereign nation driven LLMs. I, I, can, I can fully imagine China saying, I don't want this US based LLM to be available to my X billion um, citizen population. I can imagine Russia saying, I wanna be able to control the, what what comes out of the output side of those LLMs and I'll, I don't want it to be a US based entity. I could sure. imagine folks in the Middle East feeling that way. I could imagine Japan saying, God, my language is sufficiently different that I, I think we need to have our own in, the, in this world of deglobalization that we live in. Uh, um, I, I would almost be surprised, um, Kent, if we didn't see a lot of sovereign nation states saying we need to we need to have this be uh, something that we control. Super interesting. So then, again, for a, for a layperson idiot like me, what's on the horizon for these models that people aren't paying attention to? We talked a little bit about the potato chip variety. Like, is that real yet? Are you actually seeing functional? you know, models for specific use cases be be relevant? Or is that a little bit fuzzy in, in the distance? Or are there other things happening that are sort of outside of, of my visibility? Yeah, I think a lot of the current debate is focused on transformer-based models, which makes a lot of sense. That is the type of architecture that's in the mainstream. Um, but as, you know, infrastructure investors, we spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs who are thinking about how to disrupt the current paradigm. And in the model layer, we've certainly seen the rise of new architectures and also new ways to innovate on primitives of the transformer model. So examples here, are we're seeing teams 
innovate on the self-attention mechanism. We're seeing the rise of state space models, which um, are, are kind of claiming that they can be, they have models that are uh, more computationally efficient, can handle, handle longer context windows, but there's a real question of can they match up to the accuracy and precision, precision of uh, transformer-based models. There are also companies um, iterating on geometric deep learning and recursive neural networks, um, kind of claiming that their models is not just based on predictive capabilities, but now have structured reasoning. So I think that even the conversation in space is moving so quickly. What right. we're discussing this year, I think if you joined us next year, it might be completely different uh, hot button topics. I but well. Yeah, well. yeah. yeah. yeah no, it's a really interesting thought, which is like on the one hand, the success of the transformer model, maybe that tells a lot of people game over, but I bet there are a lot of people in research contexts who say, oh my gosh, look what Scale did there. What could it do to my approach? And is it likely that transformer models is the absolute dominant best approach that we just happen to have, have seen the first success with? I don't know. It'll be interesting to watch. Um, I'll, I'll add to uh, JT's amazing list there, which I agree with completely. Um, I do think the small language models um, that that could develop are these vertical specific ones. And obviously, you know, Besser has been doing a lot of amazing work with vertical software. Um, Kent is one of our OGs in this world for, for a decade plus and, and, um, and vertical AI um, certainly gives us a lens into what, uh, what is both possible and probable. And, and my view is um, I think for these, for these models to get very good, I'll take healthcare and legal as just two markets that we happen to have made um, investments in already, a bridge in healthcare and even up in, in legal tech as two examples. In both of those worlds, there's no question that um, the data that you put into that around uh, that are specialized data that will help train these models to a much greater degree around each of those two domains um are are not uh, are not maxed i'll say that way uh in what we get from the llms today um there's a lot of that data that is private uh, versus what's on the public internet and those llms have largely been trained on the public internet so i i think we will see now that now the question is is it a small language model that gets built by a smaller player uh in one in those different domains or do the mega uh language model players like an open ai or an anthropic um, or a Gemini build their own uh, in partnership with data uh, people that have data assets um, that could be plugged into those things. Yeah, that's a that's a whole different question. I don't know the answer, but it's going to be fun to watch. It, it certainly will be. All right. Well, we'll stay tuned. I'm sure we'll come back next year and talk about how wrong we were about half of this and, and bite on the other. <laughs> <laughs> to figure out which half. We'll see you next it's... year, guys.